Hey, it's Melvin, one of your friendly neighborhood podcast hosts. Whether it's your first time tuning in or you're a longtime listener, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever. Reviews are the lifeblood of the podcast world, so if you want to help us out, it'll take only a moment of your time. Otherwise, we hope you enjoy the show. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. Hey, if you just press play, you're missing out on 41 minutes of some of the most ridiculous stuff we've ever done on the podcast, contextually speaking. (laughs) It's not that ridiculous, but I think the context of you returning to do that is very (laughs) funny to me. Um, So it's 41 minutes of, um, so Daniel hasn't been on the show for a while. It's been about a year since I think his last episode, probably a year and a half by the time this episode's online. And for Patreon, I asked him, so what have you been watching in all this time? And he says... (laughs) Star Wars specifically uh, and I'm not laughing at it being Star Wars I'm laughing at it because it's Clone Wars <laughs> no I'm just that's a joke uh, that's a bad joke but um, he watches Clone Wars Rebels a uh, bunch of other um, new canon Disney canon shows and stuff yep. and then pitches 3.5 ideas as to why <laughs> it is perhaps some of the most rewarding and enjoyable material to watch if you are a Star Wars fan but haven't given it a try and then I also share my two cents as to perhaps if you haven't watched Clone Wars or you've tried it and you dropped off, you'll probably hear a bit of that with me because I also haven't engaged it, but always have had the interest in doing so. Uh, that Patreon discussion, 41 minutes is exclusive to Patreon supporters for $3 a month. Um, and if you go check out the show notes, you'll see a link for that. You can support at any tier and you gain access to this perk. There's a bunch of other perks for listening or for supporting on the podcast. Um, you'll hear about those as you're listening to this episode on The Crow. For our main episode, we're going to be doing a movie discussion on The Crow and we're also the, the 1994 version, the original. Uh, and who knows, depending on we're recording before the release of the uh, new adaption. Uh, so who knows whether or not people stan that one maybe or yeah. i imagine the people who stan it are those who like joker and harley quinn because they're dating but not necessarily <laughs> because they're in a healthy relationship um, i but... love that you're just assuming the movie isn't out yet <laughs> you're just assuming like... i just presume character uh, decisions about people that's what the bible tells me to do so i'm gonna do it <laughs> to um... be fair just looking at the one image of scars guard in the role i could see you feeling that way I, honestly i i think the he looks fine i like his character design but he looks very much dante from the devil may cry series yes which is awesome, awesome to me honestly the DMC and i one. like that game yeah. i like yeah. that game a lot uh i wish it would get a continuation but it never never will no we're going to be talking about the 1994 crow and it's going to be a movie discussion movie discussions are very simple uh, the first half is no spoilers and we talk about what do we think of the film and uh we also talk a bit about like what did the film draw out in us or what uh what did it evoke and then after that we'll go into spoilers we'll share more stuff about like symbols or maybe prominent moments in the film and then of course the ending um if you haven't seen the crow but you've read the comic we'll also be talking about the comic or if you have seen The Crow and also read the comic. We're going to talk about that too. Um, but before that, it's been a while since Dan's been on. So I thought it'd be cool to hear about what he's been up to because it's been a whole lot. And uh, I also know Dan has prepped a bit of something to say. So Dan, what's going on? Uh, so for those who, I don't know if my absence was noticed at all. Like I have no idea if anyone cared that I've been on the show. But uh, the reason I have not been on is... Previously, they Melvin has referred to me as a pastor, uh, but I have since transitioned out of that and gone into the mission field. Uh, my wife and I are currently serving overseas. Uh, we have done missionary work in a few different countries as of late, which has not given me a bunch of time to freely watch films or really watch really anything. Uh, but we've been serving overseas. I have done some missionary work in Mongolia, in Korea, in Japan. Our main focus is Japan. That's ultimately where we like to end up. And uh, if I may request prayer at the moment, uh, we are currently uh, contemplating the possibility of long term. Uh, there is someone uh, trying to start a Christian school in Japan, and they've reached Ooh. out uh, about us potentially working with them on that. There have been a couple other ministry opportunities that come our way. Uh, when you're in the mini- uh, mission field, you are not lacking for opportunity. Uh, everyone, uh, every organization and ministry is always looking for more help as they kind of never can have too much help. 
So I just want to help people understand uh, what, why mis- uh, missions is important, and why I think church should be more churches should be more engaged in the missions field in general. What, what, what would you say was is like the primary misconceptions you've observed about this and how they affect support, however you define support, whether that's money or someone's involvement? So one is the idea that a missionary is someone who you just kind of like exile from your church and send off on their way. And hopefully they do well and, you know, things go okay over there. And people don't tend to look at a missionary of the church commissions as an extension of their community, like of their church. And so when I went before our church and was going before, we have a missions committee. And one of the things I talked about is like, I don't view myself as someone who's leaving our church to go do something else. Like I am a ministry of this church. And so we are still a part of this body. We are part of this community still. And this is this church reaching out and doing ministry uh, elsewhere. And so I think for some people, the idea is scary to like leave everything behind. But also I think where churches sort of, sort of miss out is that they don't maintain those relationships. They don't really actively engage with that person. And I think that that unfortunately severs a relationship where that could create an ongoing relationship. The other thing that uh, a few missionaries expressed this to me is they think that there's this perception out there that a missionary is like an extraordinary special person. We're only unique, you know, really talented or anointed or gifted individuals go into missions. Mm-hmm. And that is simply not true. Missions is not just a person goes to a street corner in some foreign land and just spouts the gospel at passersby. Missions takes all kinds of forms and modes. Like a lot of missions is very practical. You go and you meet a need. You go and you help, you know, run an orphanage. You go and help out the at a soup kitchen somewhere. And if this sounds like ministry that you do back home, most of the time it is. It's sometimes it is yeah. a more extreme version of that environment. The basic gist of it is like you're going and you're helping people who are in need. You go and meet whatever those needs are. And so we have people that come and they just provide transportation. You know, they're like, you know what? Like I don't I didn't go to seminary. I don't have X, Y, and Z skills, but I really feel called to help out. And so they provide housing, they provide transportation. They're just being a contact in another country that we can uh, you know, talk to and set up uh, future missions trips, that sort of thing. Uh, missionaries are not always people who are the most gifted or talented in a particular area. They're just people who are willing to go. And so like, I think there's many people sitting in the pews every Sunday who could potentially go for one summer and that was the thing they did one time. And that's totally fine. Uh, or they could go and it turns out this is something they really love or are comfortable with. Right. I do think that there are a lot of people who they might actually love missions, but they because they've never tried it, because there's, an, there's a bar of entry that is admittedly intimidating, getting up and going somewhere where you might be uncomfortable or you might not necessarily yes. love everything about it. But you may actually really find that it's the thing that you love and or perhaps even called to do. Like, the refrain that sometimes you get is like, well, like, yeah, there's so much to be done here at home. Um, why, why should we focus over there when we could do stuff back here? And I, I genuinely think you could just do both, I think. Or one, because sometimes people who say that aren't doing either. Right. I mean, so. not to, yeah, not to, not to be, not to make assumptions about people, but yeah, like, I mean, uh, I would caution that if you are saying that, like, <laughs> at least if you're doing one of them, I think that'd be good. But yes, um, I, First off, I think getting involved in missions, like I think, again, people assume like you have to start like immediately at the most intense level. Like you just have to get on a plane and go. And people do do that sometimes. But I would say a good place to start would be like, I think just getting involved in missions in some way. Like does your church support any missionaries? And so praying for those missionaries, sending them newsletters, getting to know them and what ministry they're doing. Uh, because not only could that spark perhaps an interest in someone, uh, maybe more that could spark in you, like a really strong desire. Like, you know, I really feel called to the people of this country or this nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that really could get the ball rolling. And like your church is just becoming more aware of the body of Christ all over the world and what's going on and just give you more of a sense of like just how big the body of Christ is and how much need there is out there. Yes. And if your church does not specifically support missionaries, your denomination probably does. And so you could go and like, 
go talk to like who your denominational heads are and contact like you know if you're you know presbyterian so they're baptist uh, lutheran whatever like whatever denomination that you're a part of and see what they're doing uh and just sort of like become involved in that way because there's lots of ways to support missions uh just reaching out and talking to your missionaries stay in contact with them because many of them are isolated many of them have all sorts of needs uh that who knows if those needs are being met you know, there's a lot of churches that we've talked to and become in contact with. One of the basic things they do is they just ask us when our birthdays and anniversaries are and stuff. So Sweet. we get postcards and yeah. cards on holidays and that sort of thing. Or they set up um, like groups of people just to try and have Zoom calls with missionaries just to talk to them because they may be in That's a country cool. where no one speaks their language or they can't really go outside for a variety of reasons. And so like starting at that level and then from there, if that sparks something in you, like if you really feel like this call, like I should go um, to give that a shot, because at the end of the day, even if you're yeah, yeah, like I say, if you never called to missions, you were called by the Great Commission. And so yes. there is nothing wrong where you just take a two week trip, you go somewhere and you come alongside a ministry and you preach the word of God or you just tell one person about Jesus like that's not time wasted. Even if it doesn't end up being yeah. like a lifelong thing you do, that's not like a bad way to spend your time. What's one website, one or two websites that you would say are good to get connected or started for something like this? The, they'll be um, linked down in the show notes, by the way, at the top for anyone listening. Honestly, I'm going to give somewhat of an unorthodox answer to your question and say most churches, unbeknownst to their congregants, um, they're part of uh, denominations that part of their ministry is they they support uh, missionaries yes. and or yeah. they have missionary organizations that they're partnered with. Honestly, ask your pastor. <laughs> I <laughs> just yeah, good I, choice. <laughs> I genuinely think that. But obviously, like Wycliffe Bible Translators, we you know my wife has worked with them and they're great. They're trying to end Bible poverty. Uh, Voice of the Martyrs um, that focuses on the persecuted church worldwide. I will give you uh, my contact info if anyone yes. who is listening would be interested in at the very least praying for us. I will say, as Charles Spurgeon said when asked how he's successful, he said, "My people pray for me." Um, even if uh, even if you don't get my contact info, just like pray for that guy who was on that movie podcast. Um, we are <laughs> in the yeah. midst of uh, doing a lot of stuff, and so I can tell you, I have already experienced things where. I know for a fact that it was like, you know, prayer was the thing that really got us through it. And no amount of financial support or whatever would have changed our situation. Hey, don't forget, there's a lot of fun content missing from this episode because you're not listening on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support for $3 a month to gain access to uncut episodes with upwards of 40 minutes of bonus content each. You'll thank me later. Speaking of eternal life and death type situations, <laughs> yeah, let us look towards a story, a tale of woe, a tale of death and love, and a not orthodox look at how the afterlife works, but perhaps what people <laughs> who do not know the grace of God and, and the goodness of God may perceive uh, death to be like. Perceive it like the crow. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. I don't know well, what so... people believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I will say this is definitely a story that is steeped in a kind of despair in a lot of ways. Like, there's hope in it. Yeah. But there is certainly a a a, a darker, somewhat nihilistic bent to the view of death and the world. Maybe. Maybe. maybe so maybe for uh those tuning in um the crow if you're not familiar uh the this is a comic by james obar this is his first one um he had actually written it i think eight years before it was published and then it just kind of sat on a shelf and then um an independent publishing uh house that was like i these are all cursory things i read in the last three days because <laughs> we really put this together real quickly but something like it was like an independent publishing comic publisher in the back of like a comic book shop wanted to put out their first comic so this is it they put this out and um not only are editions of the comic that are released now do they include additional chapters um, but the initial story is frankly quite short when i got to the end I'm going to use quotes there. The end, quote unquote, of the story, I was actually shocked because I still had half of the the volume that I was reading through to go through. 
Um, this premise is very simple. The comic, uh, and I'll introduce the movie in a sec, but the comic is a character is hunting and killing a group of thugs, a group of punk kid, punk kids, punk, punk adults. And we're not quite sure why, but we can tell that they're criminals because they're very violent and they're very awful. And they cackle when they do stuff. They cackle when they kill people. And then um, this man with face paint, messy hair, uh, and he wears full black, shows up and kills them. But he seems to be kind of flamboyant because he's dancing and uh, he but he's still strong and tough but he's very theatrical that's the word i'm looking for we then as these killings are happening progressively learn that they all of the people he's killing with intent some people he shoots because they're shooting at him all of these people have been involved in a particular event that took place a year prior and that event was um the crow eric uh had witnessed his uh fiance being um murdered, uh, raped by these men, and then the two of them were left dead. But for some reason, a year later, Eric wakes up from his grave and uh, is alive. And he's hearing this crow that speaks to him. When he gets shot, he doesn't get injured. And he's got this mission. The comic is really simple. Honestly, not even to sound dramatic here, but the way it reads is kind of like a biblical poem like this this intense deep emotion that is inextricably tied to like life and death and love and hate there are these moments of violence and then there's these moments of eric's character just like alone and upset or sad or meditating on his lost love Um, the things he does are entirely built around it he's theatrical and his dancing and we get a flashback to a time when him him and his uh, fiance uh, were together and she was like come dance with me and he felt embarrassed he didn't want to do it and then now with her dead and he's back um, he's dancing as if to say like making up for just this thing that as my wife described doing the thing that you do for the one you love specifically for them to, to see them feel to smile and to have joy the comic is really moving and it's also very cool. <laughs> like, yeah. And and that just makes it really... It just rocks. It's just awesome. Um, the art is really detailed and complicated. Um, it's well-paced. It's just, it's really cool. And then, of course, Eric is just a cool-looking character. Um, distinct, I know for like, honestly, for like musicians and bands, especially during the 80s, Having a distinct look was cool because it was something your fans could do. So even just the design of the crow himself is just really brilliant um, in doing that. So anyways, that's that's the comic. It's way more poetic. Um, there's like a, a skeleton man in like a Western outfit that's very much indicative of death. The crow talks to him. He, the opening of the comic is Eric on a train and he watches as he this like beautiful horse that's racing the train run into a chain link fence and get killed by it. And so like it's this icon of like what his life was like that he he was watching this beautiful thing live and then die. And then uh, with subsequent release of the comics uh, of the comic. Um, like volume publications. There were additional chapters added from James O'Barr that he said were intended, but because it was so early on in his in his career, he didn't know how to put them in, both technically, because he thought there was a page limit, and then literally, because artistically, he wasn't sure how to involve them. Right. I gave all that background because the movie is very different, but not yes. like to a point that separates it. Like It is just... The energy is not biblical poem. <laughs> like, the energy of the movie is Nine Inch Nails music video. <laughs> it's it's so different. Which is great. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, but it's it's compelling. Now I know you said you had read the comic a long time ago, and I want to talk just a little more about that. But what it what did you remember like recalling from The Crow when you had initially read it? And and had you read it first and then watched the movie, or did you watch the movie and then read it? I watched the movie first. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, actually, so, okay. So I was familiar with the movie first and then I read the comic and then I really sat down and watched the movie. That's That was me too. Yeah. So I don't know what edition you read, but the edition I read also had like additional, just like, yeah, supplementary material, but also like it talked a bit about why James Abar wrote The Crow, 
Did yours have that? I have it next to me. I'll just lift it because you have video. Is this one oh. special yes. edition yeah, 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 is all yeah. it's called? Okay, so we have the same one. You know, it talks about he wrote it out of a time of great personal tragedy. And it was somewhat spurred, spurred on by reading a, a, a newspaper article about a similar tragedy to what we see in uh, the story in the film. Well, and just some additional background too. He had been in like, he was in a committed relationship with, a, he had a fiance, but he he says it was very simple. He didn't have a license. He didn't want to get a, a ticket. So he had called his girlfriend to just like, can you come pick me up for something? And then she was hit by a car. Yes, and so he yeah, just yeah. felt so responsible for that, which would then lead into even more tragedy with the film. But yeah. it's, it's in the book. You read it and you're like, this is coming from somewhere. Yeah. And for me, like I had never read a comic that was so deeply personal. Like that was the thing that really, yes. like, yeah. you know, Oof. you go from reading Spider-Man and Batman and suddenly <laughs> there's this like, it's, I was struck by like the mix, almost mixed media nature of it. Like there's yes. just joy division lyrics. And I was also very taken aback as a kid by, there's this very irreverent joke about Jesus. It's in the comic and the movie where like, you know, Jesus walks into an inn with three nails joke. And I was like, oh, like this is this is too edgy for me, you know? <laughs> and it was like, it's very violent in a um, very just matter of fact kind of way. Like the there's an image in the comic where he just puts a gun up at a wall and shoots a guy on the other side of the wall. And mm -hmm. for some reason, I always think about that. Like it was just so unlike anything I'd seen like this, like it felt like art, like it felt like I was witnessing someone's very personal diary like it felt like the version of you have a friend who just doodles in class but all the doodles are like about people they know and you know and it's like it's it's, it's like their diary but via drawings it felt like that like fully realized mixed with like this like really like like there's this tender heart at the center of it where he like you he's working through some stuff and he has all these opinions and feelings that he's trying to like articulate and it comes out in this story and I was just very struck by, I was super young too. And I read it like I must have been like 10 or 11 years old or something like <laughs> that was me and Watchmen and V for Vendetta. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me, it was a crow and the crow is also like to get somewhat into the film a little bit, but just like, it's definitely like there's a mystique around both now as a result of everything that surrounds them where the yeah. crow is a movie is like, Hey, did you hear like, this is the movie that that guy like died while making and then the crow is like, yeah. And then there's this comic it's based on. And that's like really like so different than anything you've read. So like there's these layers of mystique that surrounded both that I think really elevate both his experiences. But in addition to the fact that the material is so I'm describing it as like emotional, but then I also go into like, but it, it's also really cool. And like that kind of it mix is. makes it really like. It's it's attractive in how layered it is in that yeah. way. And then it's just deeply sad that it also has <laughs> this like historical involvement that also feeds into perhaps the same draw that we have when, you know, the classic line, you drive by an accident and you want to look at it, that kind of thing. Well, it's his layers of engagement, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. you're like, oh man, this is sick. Like, this is a sick looking character. And also like, it. this is something that's lost in time. And I was going to mention this with the movie too, but like... You talk about it's cool and it like it's cool now, but it was real cool when it came out. Like th th this was not normative for medium at the time. Like you had underground comics and stuff like that, obviously, but something mm -hmm. that broke in the mainstream this way, like where, yeah, he's kind of like a superhero, but like his costume right. is face painted the jacket and his power right. is that he can really kill you real good because he can't die. <laughs> yeah, he, he cannot die and like he will kill you. And like yeah. that, you feel like that would take out the tension, but because of all the drama that's added in and then the interactions he has with these people before he kills them is so meaningful. It's so interesting. Um, I described it to Catherine as like, like, it's not that the tension goes away. It's that like, you're now seeing the drama of like these people coming essentially face to face with death. Like this person is going to kill me. And some of them are defiant. Some of them are accepting. Some of them are like rationalizing. It's really interesting. And that's all yeah. with this character who is now alive to do this thing. That's what he believes. But then like, it's just filled with the extreme tragedy of like, 
the most beautiful thing and valuable thing in my life has been stricken from the record yeah, taken, is gone. Taken from, and yeah. not just taken, but just abused and taken, yeah, completely violated. desecrated. Yeah. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Like you said, it was personal. There's like a full page panel of him at like wherever he is. Um, you know, in the new movie, they're going to call it the crow's nest. Um, and like, <laughs> and he's just like huddled on the ground holding his own body. And he's just like calling God like the B word. And he's just like, God, you be God, you be. He's so mad. And like, I didn't find that offensive. I think some people might. Uh, the B word being like uh, a, a child that is no longer loved, that word, um, not the uh, female dog one. But because he, he's he got the turmoil of like, how could you do this, God? Like this thing was good. And it to me, it made me think of C.S. Lewis um, with a, a, a Grief Observed, where like the book starts with like, right. if God can permit this to happen, how can he be good? And like The Crow is a very secular read, but it, yes. I think that it's a very human read it's a fallen human read in a genuine way it expresses that so to me as a reader i'm finding it to be a compelling moment in this character's journey not like the author perhaps taking a jab at spirituality in any way it's a very raw look at that emotion right yes yes because it is such a vile thing to take place especially when they're just two people who love and uh, for hate to exist at all is so sickening we'll definitely talk more about the the premise of the the comic and yeah. and so on and so forth but with the film the film is um instead of dancing eric draven plays guitar um instead of um <laughs> uh moments of reflection with imagery of like horses and death constantly walking beside him as a western hero kind of this film has an entire side character from one chapter being an entire character of the whole film. Uh, Aldrich, I'm talking about, Ernie Hudson. And then even a villain, <laughs> which the comic does not have at all, which is great, yeah. by the way. I thought Michael Wincott was just hamming it up. He's having a great time. Who some of you may know as the cameraman from Nope, who is the non-electric camera. Oh, that's, electric that's camera. correct. Oh, man, yeah. I totally forgot. But yeah, he... Uh, Oh, this this film is it's like an early like, like did the, you said it was cool when it hit. But like, yeah, would you have like we're fans of the comic? I I know we're not talking about the movie now, <laughs> but like we're fans of the comic frustrated. Like, I feel like when I watched it, I was like, oh, this is dope. I love this. Is that just how everybody <laughs> felt like? <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I wasn't taking polls at the time or anything, but <laughs> I will say, unfortunately, it, yeah, Brandon Lee's death. I think really hung so heavily over the project that really there was not a ton of discussion outside of that. But I, for think about when you think about it like this, like this is 1994. So as far as we have for comic book adaptations, you have Batman, Tim Burton's Batman, you have and then the like, 1970s Superman. And so and you know, like things ones, like Dick yeah. Tracy. And so this was closer to the comic really than some other Probably like Tim Burton's Batman, while a good film and I, it's something I enjoy, he took a lot of liberties with the mythology of Batman. Um, like he completely changed it back to the Joker, for example. And so, like, this is also the era where like the Super Mario Brothers movie is a thing where you just have the characters and right. nothing else from the mythology. So, this was f like the idea of like a really faithful adaptation of a property you like, especially something that's niche and even something that's like comic booky. Um, this was far more accurate to the comic than a lot of other adaptations you would get of other properties at the same time. You think about like the Mortal Kombat movie or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Like, so like, I think fans were generally pretty happy. And also some of the changes like, Oh, oh uh, what's his name? Michael Berryman was meant to play that cowboy character from the comic, but his scenes were cut from the film. And so there were changes that weren't necessarily intentional, but that were kind of the results of, the circumstances around the production too. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. and the fact that James O'Barr was also relatively involved with the adaptation, he's all over the DVD I have, like he's, he does commentary, he's in the interviews and stuff. So he was very involved 
too. So like at the very least, I also think they got a lot of the actual kind of like mood and, and heart and soul of the story is like still there, like in my opinion, at least. So I think fans really felt that too. So I don't think people were upset with some of the liberties that were taken with the material, um, at least in my opinion. Plus like, yeah, like the music in the movie is what it is. Like, I think I love it, but it's, you know, those yes. are their covers of songs whose lyrics appear in the comic, for example, like you have like nine Chanel's does dead souls and that sort of thing. So um, that stuff's cool to me at least. So yeah, I think fans are pretty relatively happy. Yeah. And you figure it's, this is Alex Prius before he's got it. Pro yes, pro, I don't know. Prius. <laughs> this is the director. Uh, Alex Prius is um, before he started getting bigger budgets. So like right before this, I think he had done dark city. I I'm not sure when dark city came out, but I know it's, you know, prior to Y2K. Uh, oh, it's actually after <laughs> this. But this is like during an era where like it was oh, a lower, significantly lower budget. So like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense that they're covers. But the whole vibe is still rich. Like I think yes. like I was doing some reading to like get some insight of just like how people look at the film now. And obviously, like apparently there's like a following of this film that's like pretty toxic. Um, I'm oh, not sure really <laughs> that though. Yeah. Probably like if they described it as Joker before Joker, that kind of thing. I could 100% see that. Yeah. Oh, totally. Um, people who the the guy, the person was funny. He was like, people who connect with Eric Draven don't understand that the second Eric Draven proposes and the girl says yes, that they have entirely lost connection with this character. <laughs> it's like, Oof, Oof, that thrill. is just wild. <laughs> but but they were observing that like part of what drew people to the film was that it was the post Batman world of trying to make comic book movies. And so they couldn't just go the full art house route that the book would probably be if you adapted it. They still had to be exciting and fun and it still had to have that yeah, like blockbuster just... nature. And the film absolutely does. Even looking back at it, the effects here are really good. Um, there are scenes that I read. So, uh, for people we've mentioned it but brandon lee died during shooting he was shooting pretty late into the film so he's in most of the film and then there are times where there's a body double where it's from behind and then there's also times where they actually digitally put his face on the body double and like i didn't actually even know that no i was looking for it the whole time i rewatched it and i didn't notice. it's kind of crazy and like so the effects here are really good and then even some of the times where they're layering him in into like a miniature when he's like running on rooftops and stuff it still looks really good and there's also the miniatures as mentioned before which look yeah. great um and so so much of the film has that spectacle and also like the fun of what good blockbuster and then superhero movies can have that just, I don't know, it just added a lot more life to the film and then made it much more exciting to watch. So yeah, I before getting into the more spoiler stuff, I guess with the movie, I mean, the premise is super simple, so you know how it ends. But like, right. I thought it was a ton of fun. I didn't expect it to be so different. So that was kind of a surprise, but still really quite enjoyable. And then that kind of throwback to being like around the era of like, we're trying to still make good superhero movies and we can't all be dark man where it's just original <laughs> like i i thought this was just just delightful um and then i enjoyed the you know the alternative direction that this took in contrast to the original and i was hoping to see that the new film which is probably already out now but like i was hoping that the new film would be a more of a direct adaption but then i read the description for the film on imdb and it's not that at all so uh, whatever I, yeah i have uh, <laughs> not learned much about this new i'm just glad initially he's gonna have star what mark Wahlberg and stuff like that whoa so like, yeah right can you <laughs> even imagine he's can way too even imagine he's, and not to be mean to him, but he's just too old. Like for Eric Draven, you mean? Like, yes. that'd be crazy. That's yes. crazy. I, That's I have to go back and double check that. But I believe at one point he was attached to Star. <sighs> Daniel, um, Daniel, I am putting my foot down. Hollywood is not allowed <laughs> to make decisions like this anymore. I'm just yeah. I'm putting my foot down right now. It's down. <laughs> my statement has been. You made. hear that, Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> just all throughout, like Mel oh, Mel Melvin said, <laughs> like. <laughs> But for spoilers, I will say um, I have previously recommended th this film, apparently, according to you. Both the film and the book, yes. Yes. I Part of what stands out even now is it's like the very first thought watching the first like five to ten minutes, which is like Marvel would never. Like they would never no. 
no. allow a movie to look like this, to feel like <laughs> this. It's instantly like a very dirty and sweaty movie. Like everything is just covered in uh, <laughs> grime and all the characters are grimy as well. They're all just awful to each other. Yeah. Contrary to the poetry, it does in fact rain all the time. Yes. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so cool. It can't rain every day, but it rains most of the time. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. It's just a movie that is like 75% vibes. Like that is a lot of the film. Like it is not a movie that's about the big action scene. It is a movie about the cool pose Eric Draven strikes before the action scene starts. And then it's about the grisly aftermath after um, it is mm-hmm. while it is much more of a standard action movie than the comic is, it is still heavily kind of a mood piece. Like you just get a sense of like this place, this terrible city they live in. And there's just ra- Yeah, there's random scenes where Eric Draven's playing guitar on top of a building. Uh, he says cool one liners and is kind of, yeah, like flamboyant. He's kind of Joker esque, stupendously endearing. He's so yes. endearing. Yeah. Like the first thing he does, he just jumps off a building and starts cackling maniacally in a dumpster. And right. the villains he faces are just as animated and weird as he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, they're so have, fun. What's his name? John Polito is like is a, just a guy running a pawn shop, and he's just a, a, a scumbag. Great lines too. The his his exclamation when he's scared had me cackling. <laughs> I, don't remember, I don't remember what he says, but he's like "s on me, s on me." <laughs> and I'm just oh. losing it, and he keeps saying it over and over as Eric Dream is getting closer to him. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, man. <laughs> yeah, it it really is like stylistically it stands out so much, but even more than that, just watching this character and we'll get more into this. I I mean the basic premise I wouldn't consider a spoiler, but I mean I don't know if you do, but I like he he has this tragedy, it motivates him to kill everybody, and he can't die. That's the movie. He <laughs> like, comes it, back. So he's gonna win. He can't die. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> it is it is impossible to talk about this movie in any sort of detail without addressing, and I'll we'll mention it. I'll mention it now. Yeah, Brandon Lee tragically passed away during the film. The first thing you see his character do in the movie is crawl out of a grave. Yeah, and that is the tone the whole time. It is just he truly is kind of the heart and soul of this movie. It is hit like Brandon Lee hangs heavily over this particular project, and I do think that that like imbues every scene that he's in with this kind of just interesting eeriness and like it is just an interesting it is just an interesting experience in that sense like the you hear about the first apart from the um uh production credits like the miramax and so on and so forth his name is the first thing you see and then it says the crow and then he crawls out of the ground so yeah that yeah that is the the whole film and You know, your friend tells this was the era where your friend like, hey, man, you would see this movie. The guy died and you go to your friend's basement and you watch the DVD or VHS, which is how I watched it, you know, in my friend's basement. And you just watch this really cool movie that is just aesthetically. Yeah, they're playing The Cure. They're playing Nine Nails. My Life of the Thrill Kill Cult just shows up and plays a concert during the movie. And Dumb. you watch him run on rooftops and just perch, literally perch outside of windows before he so goes cool. and kills a dude. It is. Yeah, it is just it's a movie, but it fe- again, it feels almost like you're watching like an extended music video with these interesting interludes. And it's just, it, it is an experience and it's one that you don't get a lot anymore. It reminded me a lot of daredevil. And I really felt like, Oh, they're probably that. cause like Batman is a success. Dark man is original, but it's a success. The crow is a success. So it's like, what else is Daredevil going to look back to 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 be successful with apart from, I guess, Spider-Man. And so then like, yeah, you're, I, I, and I, I like Daredevil. I mean, people can listen to that episode. It's like a year or two ago, but like, I thought it was a good film and I'm excited to finally get it. Yeah, the, the Ben Affleck uh, film. Uh, the only one, uh, if I might add. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I love the uh, Netflix show. But but there's such uh, influence that I was observing in The Crow through that uh, about like, just the just honestly the entire film i was like oh my gosh did daredevil just steal from the crowd <laughs> like all these vibes because that's basically the same thing but with like new metal <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah instead of like the cures <laughs> burn playing while he suits up you get wick me up you know it's just a very so different cool. vibe but right. yeah we can get into spoilers now I, obviously i recommend the, the movie outright yeah I totally great, I, but... it, it, really great film there's some content to look out for check the imdb guide or or common sense media it's specifically there is um sexualized violence that i think some people might find very uncomfortable so right um but then uh but the violence is cool and if you don't think that's cool <laughs> then I don't know why you're listening. <laughs> this is not the movie for you. So. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listener, we've got a mailbag now. Open those show notes, scroll down a little, and you'll see a mailbag link. Press it and send us a text with a question and your first name, and we'll answer it in a future episode. So if any questions pop up while you're listening to the rest of this episode, you know what to do. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I am... I, um spoilers are free but i didn't have a specific spoiler to talk oh, about okay. but i just i think uh well f- to to make it a formal transition then to the spoilers so i'll bring up one you have this main villain like <laughs> like what what the heck <laughs> like a samurai wielding long-haired equally as theatrical bad guy in yeah. michael wincott's character top dollar <laughs> who is in the comic but just isn't the same as this like it's very different has someone there... had to be the main villain that was the thinking <laughs> so not death not misery not god not circumstance you can't be... make an action movie where he fights <laughs> i mean actually that'd be awesome if he fought like death or whatever but yeah you can't <laughs> you can't make an existential action movie he needs to kill someone at the end of the movie you know so right yeah might as well be top dollar which was awesome by the way do you want to describe how he falls off the roof and dies well yeah he <laughs> digitally falls off a roof and then it cuts to him just like horribly impaled on a gargoyle where like one of the horns is coming through his mouth yeah and uh, we had already seen that as the rain is pouring the mouths of the gargoyle have water pouring out of their mouth yes. but now the one that he's spoke through blood is just funneling out his <laughs> yeah mouth. they they don't hold back on the blood in this movie and that, yeah. that's what that's one thing that's kind of interesting is like it's a way to look at this movie too is just like the reason this exists in the form it does is because the batman was successful but like in stark contrast to that this is borderline a slasher movie. Yeah, it's a slasher movie where we're watching the protagonist get his kills, really. But he also just simultaneously, they still carry over his kindness that he shares. He's, right. He hates the people who particularly destroyed his life and destroyed his, his fiance's life. But then he goes after anybody who essentially, like unlike the, the comic where he helps people and then moves on, the movie transitions to giving him like connections that are still in his life. And then of course the ending is they take advantage of that. And that's how we get our final fight on the top of a church during grade <laughs> where he uses the spoke of a spire as a sword. Oh, it's so yeah, cool. It's struck by lightning <laughs> as he's grabbing it. Like yeah. it's just, it's awesome. And yeah, so like, yeah, it is a movie. There are two parts, broadly speaking, it was three parts. There is scenes where Eric Draven is melancholic Scenes where people in his life that he cares about either talk about him or finally reunite with him, and then scenes where he kills people. Those are broadly mm-hmm. speaking the kind of three things that happen at the movie, and they're kind of intertwined with one another. And I think they feed into each other in kind of an interesting way, where you, I, you do enough to balance them out as like a character that you can root for and care about, and then make these other characters so despicable and so horrible and likable. That you, when he goes to a junkie and just like who uh, he's a killer who also is a junkie, I should clarify, and just stabs his body with like 15 like needles of heroin. (laughs) Like, you're like, ah, I guess he had it coming, you know, you know, because the things they do are so unspeakable that like it kind of justifies anything that Eric Draven does to them. But then in Mm -hmm. that same scene, he like convinces the woman he's seeing to go back and care for her daughter, who is his friend, who is Mm -hmm. like our child actor character who's actually quite good as far as child actors go like she does a great Mm -hmm. job with the role she's given Mm -hmm. and so like it is this like cathartic kind of experience where i don't know if you want to get into the themes of the movie well so in the book he's way more of this like the spirituality is way more present in the book uh, as stated he even argues and says things to god uh and so um this duality of his character of having such 
an extreme hatred for evil and then this desire for just fatal justice violent justice is there but then yes he has these moments of kindness that are similarly present that are so gentle because he is he's a lot like jigsaw in that way he wants these people <laughs> to have an appreciation for life a gentle jigsaw <laughs> a jigsaw so, plays a guitar <laughs> <laughs> and dances and spends time with his cat but he he's investing into these people even where these other people are being destructive and it just makes them more, it just makes his, it makes him come across similar to, to how, like, I think many people feel in general or perceive a savior to be the savior comes in and he wipes out, he blots out evil and then he helps those who are good and righteous. And he also helps those who are being taken advantage of, or have perhaps have given into the delusions of evil. And I think that that's what makes his character so well-rounded and compelling. It's similar to Rorschach. I know a lot of people find Rorschach out of Watchmen, the most relatable, uh, emotionally, I would hope not real in reality, <laughs> um, because he's this character who feels this compulsion to enact justice where the police cannot do it. And so, and they add in that here a little bit in that Eric Draven asks Albrecht, like, what did you guys do? You guys didn't do anything to these guys, like uh, to the point that now I'm back and I'm going to make a fix of it. But, I, and so, yeah, like you're mentioning these three different forms of things his melancholy characters talking about him and then lastly like him actually taking action and yeah. like all of them wrap up also with these themes that he carries on his shoulders um you're making me appreciate the movie frankly more in that way oh, okay. but i also know it's present in the source material that <laughs> the whole thing is about him and every dynamic so it's just it's just clever and like as far as like like the theme that you get like in kind of what I mean, the opening narration talks about it, but it's just the idea that like true love is like forever, right? Like it's like the thing that brings him back is his love for his, uh, well, not wife, tragically died. She dies before the day before their wedding because um, they're getting it weird in Halloween because they're awesome. Um, they're super cool. Yeah, they're super cool. But it's like not even death can separate him from the person that he loves. And like, there is certainly truth to this, but it is like this, like extreme, like example of like the way kind of love feels right. Like when mm -hmm. the, as soon as the movie ended, I looked at my wife and said, I would do that for you. <laughs> like, you <know? laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And that's how every guy watching the movie feels, I guess, or, you know, and um, I think part of why the character has this draw for so long and why so many of those couples in your high school would really get into the story and dress up like the characters or whatever is because it is like, it is aspirational in a sense, right? Like you love someone so deeply that not even death itself can separate the two of you. But even if some, some great injustice is done, you would claw your way out of a grave and you would go and make those people pay. And it's like, there's such an intense uh, emotion feeling that they're, they're conjuring up. You know, like it may not be literal, but it is at a primal level how true love feels, right? Like you said, like, you know, like nothing can separate me from how much I love my wife. Nothing can separate me from the people that I love. And I think that's partially why this story resonates so much, but also it is in a weird way, a way that we can sort of continuously appreciate like Brandon Lee, right? Like he mm -hmm. is forever tied to this film, like because of the horrible circumstances around his death. And he died making it like, you know, there is a sense of like, yeah, he kind of haunts this movie forever. And like, as like a multi-layered experience, right? Like you, he's just there and you can put the movie on and there he is. And he's, if you have the special features, he's in, he's there talking, giving interviews about how much, how proud he is of the movie, how excited he is for the movie to come out, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yeah, like, like it's not immortality per se but he does get to in a weird way live on through the movie and it, it's it's interesting in that way but you know i definitely think that like purely as a romance this movie really knocks it out of the park like as a tragic romance and like yeah in the end he's still we see him reunite with his loved ones again at the end but it is after he does his herculean task you know yeah and, and not to um 
consist not to join the cavalcade of sensationalizing that is over this man's tragic death but right. it's also like it's unavoidable though. he dies during the scene in which like his character was supposed to die um his his he was going to get married i think like within days of after the end of the shoot and so there's all these details that kind of uh are ex- explain why it's been elevated to the status that it's kind of at and then the attraction that's held for it and then i also like this is just something i've been thinking about lately in general but like movies as a particular medium preserve something about people that is just unique in contrast to something like books or, or photos um they don't just take the likeness but they take your voice they take your interpretations of the way you see things and yeah he's playing a character but it's a, his interpretation of it and then like you mentioned there's these behind the scenes interactions it's like a movie that's elevated specifically by the fact that it's a movie because well, because what's interesting to find to to add this to the mix i think that i like the movie a lot but it is also cheese. It is also not always perfect. It no, is no, no, also no. <laughs> like this film that every now and then you're like, I wish it was a little different. <laughs> like the conversation when he just goes to hang out with Albrecht. <laughs> like, I like that scene, but I think there was a better way to do it. <laughs> I like that <laughs> like, the cop is just wearing his hat. Yeah, like, it's so house. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just that was, that was very funny. Which, by the way, this movie... In contrast to the book, is funny. <laughs> like, it's like it's yeah. a genuine. There's a good consistent. Can we get a fire it up? Fire it up for the audience. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, um, but all of that just again adds to this layer of the material of how you engage it and all this stuff. And movies are communal, whereas reading comics and books are very singular. So it almost even means medium wise, they're perfect for the type of story they're telling because the communal aspect of the excitement of the fun and the fun and the comedy but also the tragedy works whereas if you're reading the crow intimately the emotions are drawn out a little differently i mean you didn't mention this but there's even poems that are just straight in a different language so it's like i don't think james abar cares what i think about (laughs) the book at all (laughs) like he's just like i gotta write this i gotta put this here it feels like the it's more for him than even any audience yeah and then it's just beautiful that it ends up being something that resonates so well with others hey there listener want to influence the podcast Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. Yeah, there's so much to to chew on for a film that otherwise, if you watched it with no context, you'd probably just go, that was fun. And then just go home and yeah. you'd never think about it again. <laughs> it's which so which is, in its own way is a shame because it is a movie with a lot of personality. Like there's all these little touches. Like there's a scene where cops chase someone, but as they drive away, a cop just spills coffee at himself. And it's just like, yeah. Screaming. Yeah. Like that's there's so all good. these yeah. little touches that show like personality that like, again, like, in a landscape where projects like this, there's a million people involved to, they want to make sure they get their investment back. So anything that can be seen as too goofy, too silly, too cheesy gets jettisoned for fear that it might lose a percentage off the tomato meter or, you know, like I, I mm-hmm. like, you know, I, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word right now, but like, you know, not be like engageable for a particular part of the audience. Cause it might be, they find, might find it too weird, too silly, accessible. Thank you. Well, mm-hmm. this like they go full on like, yeah, the villains have a goofy dance they do with each other like there's and they're like, also rapists. Yeah, yes, like, it's like you have they're both. the worst people, it's, but it's they're crazy. silly, you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of dated elements too. like the editing in places is a little weird. Like there's freeze frames that like you don't <laughs> awesome. see that in movies anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but that all adds, I think, to the personality of it where, again, like it. It, in so many ways, it feels like a not just a, like oh they can't make movies like that anymore, but like you just you <laughs> literally can't like yeah. they shot this in like without a lot of the like, the restrictions that they had now have in productions like they were basically trying to stretch a smaller budget to make a big budgeted movie. People were, part of what led to the tragedy is like people weren't like working that day. Like they sent the firearms expert home early. Like you know like all these things that you just you literally could not make a movie like this anymore. Like it's so slapdash. Like part of the look of the movie 
is a result of the of like the the environment mm-hmm. that they were shooting in you know and so it's like it really is just like a vestige of a particular time and i think i will say this i think part of what makes recommending it a, a not hard but like uh, you do have to throw a caveat of like yeah it's like dated but also like it is a movie that like is somewhat it's impacted somewhat lessened from decades of references like you're talking about how like yeah i can see bits of this in daredevil but like yeah the look of the crow it's, it's everywhere it's everywhere yeah, you know it's everywhere uh famously the wrestler sting in 1996 literally donned a gimmick that people just start calling crow sting where for 25 years he has wrestled with face paint that looks like the crow he even his entrance music had the same crow sounds as the movie he would <laughs> he would pose in the rafters like eric draven does wholesale just stole the character um but yeah if that's your if that's your context for this type of character going back you might it might seem even a little cliche to see some of the poses he strikes and you know because of decades of like you know merchandising and like you know, no offense like hot topic type stuff you make it like yeah definitely why is this hot still, topic yeah. yeah why is this still cool but like it was very cool at the time and i think you do have to kind of look at it with different lenses a little bit because i still think it's cool personally oh my gosh it's awesome <laughs> it's it's you have a list of cool movies and most of them are filled with john carpenter films but then yeah the crow fits in there just fine um yeah watching it especially in contrast to we're we're like in you know, Marvel fatigue has been talked about since 2012, 2000, 2013, <laughs> but like we are officially in it. And I think like Deadpool and Wolverine has people thinking like, oh, it's, we're getting it back or whatever. But like it is still here. And so like to be able to watch like because it is this this is definitely a superhero movie. The The book is yeah, like a yeah as i described it but like the movie is a superhero adaption of it he has powers we see those powers he has a weakness <laughs> which he did not have in the comic at all and so like there someone was just... like how do we make tension for the final fight we gotta do something <laughs> yes yeah and so like and then yeah there's like sidekicks and everything we, you mentioned tony todd like he's, he's a ton of fun here too and so like there there is something really cathartic about watching a superhero movie that has it just has impact it has personality it has a stench like you said it's very authentic and real and i think like like we i talked about this a bit in the patreon section the like sequel syndrome of like these things kind of lingering and like part of that is whenever i like spend time thinking about it is it's stuck in this idea of like things not feeling authentic or real. And I think like watching a film like this or just as an encouragement to people who are tired of superhero films, but remember the time that they enjoyed them (laughs) and haven't seen The Crow yet, like something about the film makes it have that much more excitement. It doesn't waste time. The Basically the first, frankly, up from him, like getting up out of the ground, learning what happened and then like deciding to put on the face paint. It's like an episode of television and like it just gets you hype and excited for the rest of the movie. And so, yeah, I, I, it's cool. Yeah. I just, it's just dope, man. I mean, <laughs> we could go around in circles, keep saying it, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> It, so. part, yeah, it part of yeah, part of why it's we just stick out of like yeah, it's awesome because I, I you know <laughs> sitting there watching it, you're just like every time he's like it just cuts to him like you know doing on something the scaffolding, <laughs> yes waiting to go in the room to shoot a guy like you're just like yeah man that's dope like yeah it's, and like his kindness is very cool like it's almost aspirational <laughs> it's like really yeah. sweet yeah <laughs> he's in the middle Even of a it's... revenge murder craze and he goes and hugs a little girl you know that's yeah that's he's his, very sweet he has a cat named gabriel he takes it care of you know the save the cat yeah. kick the cat rule thing but like if it yeah part of what gives it extra oomph like beyond the coolness is yeah it deals with all of these like very heavy topics and sometimes people will be like well this isn't just a superhero movie it's a spy thriller or, you know or whatever or it's about grief right. but like <laughs> hey this movie is actually about grief for starters yes. but like it deals with those themes in such like not just it's not heavy handed in the sense that it's too obvious but it does such a great job of giving you these visceral, like you can reach out and touch the themes that they're talking about. Like he goes and is just like crying at her grave. You know, he is, Mm -hmm. he laughs just seeing like kids in Halloween costumes run past him. Like there's all these like moments where you get this like brief, but like very effective characterization for him. 
And like, you do feel like you're watching someone's like epic journey unfold in front of you. Like it feels like you're watching like Persephone or the story of Persephone or whatever, like this like doomed love, except that in the end you get a sense that he is reunited with her in the end. It's like, it is a very satisfying story about these like, frankly eternal themes like we will Mm -hmm. forever Mm -hmm. be writing stories about love but also like yeah like i mean as believers you know we have hope that we'll be reunited with our loved ones we don't feel the tragedy that kind of like in some ways like like uh it just drips off of this movie where like yeah man it wouldn't be wouldn't it suck if we were separated from the people we love forever but like you know we do have that assurance that we'll be reunited with these people in the end and should something like this happen i wouldn't feel the need to come out of my grave and murder everyone (laughs) because you know like you know vengeance is lords or whatever but like it does like it does do do that in such a tangible way that like under the reason we go, yeah, that's awesome. is because we're like, and he's about to kill that guy that like threw knives at him, you know, whatever. Like it's mm-hmm. like, it's cool because because of what it's about. And it just happens to have this like amazing veneer that it adds, adds extra layer, layers of nineties, like awesomeness on top of it. It's also fiction is like the realm for us to play with these ideas in a very blunt and raw way, which the, Obviously, we've mentioned the literature does in spades, but then it lets us experience a taste of those things. We get to have experience the feeling and taste of like the justice of death is coming for the people who deserve it kind of thing. And then like the yeah. the the hope of like love that's coming back or finding its place in this miserable awful town that they are living in <laughs> um, and like yeah, and that it doesn't actually come so much through the book although there is still love and joy to be had in the book it's just very different and um yeah and i think that that journey is so compelling because it's a continued taste of those things in a way that's very yeah like there's no there's no alternative read to the things that are being played with. No, here. no, no. And I think that that's what makes it so much more valuable. This is just showcasing a really proficient and effective way in just being like in your face. And like yeah. that kind of is, is the whole film. It's just in your face. It doesn't mind how one of my <laughs> notes I think I wrote was like, it's loud. And that was a compliment. Like it is just, <laughs> it's ready to tell you what it's all about and it's going to do it the best way possible. Yeah, like the scene where he like puts the makeup on the first time. They turn that cure the cure up in that scene, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. I felt like the guy in the studio was like, This rocks. It was just like <laughs> and, Yeah. And I uh, yeah. So I'll, cool. Also I'll just mention this, like Ernie Hudson doesn't get enough credit as an actor. I like people when people talk about his filmography, he's not just the fourth Ghostbuster. Gosh darn it, he's the police officer in in The Crow. He deserves yeah. more credit for that. And he's good. And he's good. In, he's good in this. Yeah. Want some quick updates on the podcast? Follow the Cinematic Doctrine Instagram for cool posts and story updates. Press the link in the show notes or search Cinematic Doctrine, that's one word, in your Instagram app. Oh, and we're on threads. Check us out there, too. Uh, so do you want to talk and speculate about the Crow 2024, <laughs> which for the listeners, I guess, is already out. But like <laughs> for us is not. And I will choose to live in this reality forever. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the sticky subject of like if it's even appropriate to remake the movie, given Alex Proyas has long said that it's been his personal part of why he claims that part of why it's taken so long is because he's made done everything in his power to prevent the movie from being remade mm. uh, because he felt like it was inappropriate. Now defenders of it will point to the fact there's multiple sequels to the crow including a television show yeah which star uh a lot of names that'd be funny when you read when you read them the varying actors iggy pops in yeah. one of them the guy who plays angel and buffy is in one of them as a guy named lucifer edward Fur- furlong is in the 2005 Ed- one edward furlong stars in that one with the guy who plays angel I get the re I I mean I get the logic, right? Like it's a famous cult movie. It's that perfect sweet spot of it's very familiar in a way that will cause people to be like, oh cool, the crow. Like everyone knows the look of the character, but also not overly familiar where people wouldn't be interested in seeing it again. You know, people know the character and the visuals of it more than perhaps have seen it or read it. So it's in that good sweet spot for like a name adaptation, especially in the like 
adaptation attempt started during the comic book movie like mcu boom so in two, yeah, 2009 was when it was announced that mark Wahlberg <laughs> was being tapped to play the character which wild at this point why not just give him a, <laughs> give him a cameo in the movie it's like an <laughs> alternate universe one or something and yeah and to be fair there's multiple comics that have different characters doing donning the crow moniker um, not eric draven other characters take up the mantle blah blah but we all know they're remaking this one. They're remaking this specific story and character. Yes. And I I just, I don't see the reason for it. Like, this feels like such a definitive version of this story. Like, yes, it is not a straight adaptation of the comic, but the Crow movie is the Crow movie. And I just, any right. version will just pale in comparison. There just isn't, at least to me. I mean, even if you have state-of-the-art action sequences, even if you have the best special effects, even if you get another rockin' soundtrack with people covering, you know, 80s, like, New Order and Joy Division songs or whatever. Like, it just, no matter what ingredients you put in, for various reasons, the resulting, like, film, I don't think will, it won't feel the same way. It won't hit the same way. And for a movie that, like I said, is so heavy on the vibes and how it makes you feel and how it aesthetically is like to look at and experience and listen to and and, uh, watch, it just, I just don't see the point especially when it does feel so cynical. Like if, if James O'Barr was personally overseeing a new version of the crow for whatever reason, because he wanted to make a more faithful adaptation of his story, that would be one thing. I mean, the guy recorded his own soundtrack to go along with the comic, which I've never listened to. Hmm. I've always planned on it, but like, but it's not that it's some studio has the right to do it. So they just want to do it again. And I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Like I get it. I get it in the sense of like, I can see why someone would do it, but I just don't why I don't get why I would see it. Like, I just don't see the appeal of going to see it personally other than morbid curiosity. Yeah. I morbid curiosity might get me. And if, if, if I stripped out all of the knowledge I have of the crow and I just had the movie watching it, I was even thinking like, like you could re you could retell this story. Like you could do different versions, and different directors could speak into the character, different ways of interpreting it because the comic still exists and it's its own thing. Or even like a version of the movie could be way more a like way more the comic, uh, whatever that would even look like. And then even when I was looking up like other crow movies, I saw that like there is, it's, it's like a DIY, no budget version called James O'Barr's the crow from 1998. Yes. And it's just like fans who like shot on video, like their own version. And it's like, we're just going to follow the comic and that's what they did. And so like part of me almost feels like, within theme of the material and the legacy that it's had since its inception, that seems like the most appropriate because it calls back to the DIY nature of the original material. It feels faux pas. It feels, it feels weird. And I'm, I know I'm saying that as, as you know, a new fan, uh, someone who just (laughs) watched them within the last three days, but like, I'm, I'm capable of reverence. <laughs> I'm right, capable right. of knowing when something is like, no, I don't think you should touch that. Yeah, but that's the power of it, right? You instantly like, oh, I get it. Yeah. You know, I get it. And you know? in comparison, like the before we recorded, I brought up how like a lot of people love Jacob's Ladder, another 90s movie, very, uh, very emotional, very cerebral, psychological film. And like that movie to me is very good and very interesting, but it's also like remake worthy. Like I watched it thinking like there's better ways to do some of these scenes, but I also still really like that movie. It had a remake a couple years ago, but the difference is it didn't have like a Skarsgård in it as the lead character <laughs> who was a named actor who was in a billion dollar film <laughs> with, with it. Um, and then also uh, I'm pretty sure it was just like a Tubi film. Like it was not that it was made by Tubi, but it was just tossed up DTV. Like it wasn't in theaters or anything. And it was like a new way of interpreting the material, which I guess was just, oh, it's not set in Vietnam. It's set in Desert Storm. But like, <laughs> like totally different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ex- yeah, completely. Um, even that feels weird, though, because like Jacob's Ladder doesn't have all the other baggage, the myth, mythology of it. 
but it's also a very particular story that also feels oddly personal and then has also got that cult following. Yeah, it just seems like it just seems weird. And yeah, like I don't think you can get away from the cynicism. And then it doesn't help that the visual of the new film is Jared Leto Joker. Like that, that doesn't help. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's a window where you can release this movie and it might be more well ex- ex- like accepted. That ended the minute that 2016 Suicide Squad came out. You know, yeah. like, uh, like, and I, honestly, like, I think it wouldn't surprise me if I heard that the popularity of the Joker in general helped is part of what propelled this movie through production. Like, first you had Heath Ledger's Joker, then you had Jared Leto's Joker, and then people like, hey, people love face painted skinny guys that play by their own <laughs> rules, you know? And, you know, and oh, so someone said it's there's funny. money there and just kept pushing it through, which just makes me more angry. I know I just made up a thing. I got angry about it, which is like rule, <laughs> rule one of the internet. Don't do that. But like, <laughs> you can't tell me that that didn't play a part, right? Like the mixture mm-hmm. of like, Oh, like people like these edgy comic book movies, you know, people like the Joker, that wrestler sting is still wrestling. He just, he just retired like a year ago. Like kids mm-hmm. love this stuff. Let's just, let's do it. Been itching for cinematic doctrine merch. Check out the support tiers on Patreon. We're offering merch to those who support at select tiers. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and share your support. There's a link in the show notes too. You, you mentioned that the, the fandom is very passionate and I can't, I think that's a specific fandom that will out of spite not see it too. Yes. They might pirate it just to see it, but I don't think they'll pay money to see it. I I agree. This is like, if you ever wanted to understand why people pirate like one convincing reason, spite is one of the (laughs) strongest. And this is one of those cases where like, yeah, I could almost imagine like the only reason that this will get talked about is someone will find a cringy scene from the film and make a reel about it for yeah, like some sort of TikTok yeah, yeah. and share it. And then people will see that scene and that's it. Hey, it's uh it's editing Melvin cutting in real quick. Uh yeah. It is October 7th, and what I said in this recording back in mid-August happened exactly as it happened i mean anyone could have predicted it it's not just me Uh, a clip from the film made the rounds on instagram and probably tiktok too it garnered 1.2 million views and over 42,000 likes the audio in the original clip had been modified by the poster likely to avoid trouble since the film was still in theaters as well as added a laugh track but the dialogue is rough here's the clip laugh now cry later it's kind of how things have been playing out for me. Well, for me, it's more like cry now, cry later. <laughs> Want to hear a joke? Uh, I don't know. Is it funny? Not really. Great. Go for it. What kind of tea is hard to drink? I don't know. Reality. Wow. Well, that's um, <laughs> that's something. It's just like when Sam Raimi did his, um, he did a short on Quibi for the 12 night, uh, 12 states or 50 states of fright. And it was the golden arm clip that was going around. Um, and it's like that, that out of context does look ridiculous, especially if you're not a Sam Raimi fan, you're like, this is ridiculous. The the golden arm is making her sick and she's going to die. Why doesn't she just get rid of it? And it's like, that's the joke. <laughs> like you don't get it, but that's what went around online because people spite purchase Quibi at the time <laughs> and then they watched that and went this sucks this is why no one's getting it and that's all anyone knows yeah that's kind of the air you get with this remake where like the mythology is now moving against the film and like yeah you i just i actually just opened up the crow imdb 2024 and like i went to the trivia section and all of the top is like various trivia talking about actors and people involved in the original film going, I've never even seen the original Crow movie because like I'm emotionally attached to the tragedy and I am not going to see the new film (laughs) because it feels wrong. And so like, I, I don't know, that just seems weird. And then in addition to that, the Crow is a horror movie or it's very much a slasher horror movie. So it has similar fans and those fans are rabid and they keep up with the behind the scenes and they go to conventions where they see these people. So like, 
it, I, it seems like a miscalculation. We could be totally wrong. Maybe this movie is the next billion dollar yeah, when film it comes of the out, year. It's like get a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turns out they figured out how to resurrect Brandon Lee and he's in the film. So like, I don't know, maybe obviously that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, but Not like, in a way that wouldn't make people upset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they did digitally uh, bring him back, just like Ghostbusters Afterlife. What an embarrassment! Um, oh, people awful. would be so mad. Like, I'd be mad. I would like, I'd fly back to America just to like slap Scarscar in the face. But maybe know. not. Maybe like Ghostbusters Afterlife, people who just get pop finals and they remember the toys will be like, oh, "That's so touching." Like, and obviously it's a different canon, so they're not doing it. But Ghostbusters yeah, Afterlife, it's... people were just like, it's great. And like, what? That's ridiculous. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously the answer will be, you know, people will know the answer to this by the time they listen to it. However, looking at it, the budget for the remake is $50 million. So that's pretty small. Yeah. It's a pretty small budget. So it's is safe. there enough like general under, like familiarity with the material like, is there enough of that pie chart of people who would recognize the crow as a thing they remember, but don't have a strong connection to it or strong feelings about it to make the movie profitable, you know, and move enough merch because this yeah. thing could probably sell a lot of merch. You know, I think I think someone did the math and was like, look, if we only make it for this much money, like this isn't going to be a three hundred million dollar movie or whatever. <laughs> so this is going to be. Oh, that's yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> If we only desecrate this myth, this, the mythology <laughs> of this film, if we only pee on this grave this much, <laughs> then it will only kill this much grass. And like, just, ah, uh, I do not like this. <laughs> yeah. Worst case scenario is like, yeah, people will get mad, but if at least if it makes a hundred million dollars or whatever, which is not a lot, like it's a wide release, big, like, big name movie could very easily make a hundred million just since like, you know, in a month or whatever. Yeah. Worst case scenario, they make back their money, but everyone hates it. So they just don't make more. But like, you know, if, if we, play, it's, I can picture someone in, in a room going like, but guys, if we pull this off, right, there's a sequel, there's like a direct to streaming, whatever, you know? So there's, there's money and gold in them Hills. Uh, sorry. Editing Melvin again. There is no money, there is no gold, there is no hills. The Crow 2024 had an estimated budget of $50 million, so marketing was likely an additional $25 million. That comes out to a $75 million budget. The Crow 2024 is gross worldwide, just under $24 million. This film was a massive financial failure. Anyways, back to the episode. I, I plan for this part of the conversation because it would be interesting to do like a pre post conversation in that we're talking about it before the film comes out, but it's coming. This episode comes out later, but now I feel like you took advantage of the fact that I'm recording super late at night and you're in the morning and you wanted to make me upset so that when I go to bed, <laughs> I am frustrated, flustered and angry and unable to go to bed because I'm okay, thinking about night the nightmares that like you went to the theater to see something else. You sit down, it's just the crow. <laughs> You're like, oh, no, I gave them my money. <laughs> I'm just super mad because why are they doing this to this film? They could what just... would what would be an acceptable angle in the material, right? Like it's a guy who just watched the 1994 crow movie and that's his inspiration to become the crow. <laughs> like what's the angle it can make where would, people would not be upset so that's so it's the crow but he thinks he's the crow but it's a movie that's more like super <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Right. It, i think that would work <laughs> it's a ex dark exploration of fandom and parasocial relationships yeah something. instead of the people's joker it's the people's crow uh i would <laughs> i would enjoy that crow. <laughs> it could be all, right. all lawsuits preventing it from being playing at film festivals and stuff. <laughs> yeah yeah and only only weirdos check it out and the <laughs> They're, it's it's the alt rights version of the people's joker. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is the only no, we've, we've gone release. too far in that direction. It's worse now. <laughs> yeah, Andrew Tate reprises his role as scumbag number 12. <laughs> oh my gosh. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show.
so the crow 2024 uh what's our stance on this i don't recommend that movie i don't think it's good i've seen it already it's not very good at all uh <laughs> that's, even that's if it's good like how good would it have to be to like for me like how good would it have to be to make me feel comfortable with its existence it'd have to be like the best movie i've ever seen you know what i mean like even if it's just pretty good like i don't think it justifies like it's existent at least for me personally that's just how i feel about it like even if it's pretty good or whatever like nah to close it out like uh, with the flash seeing that it took me and i'm not I, i mentioned this in the in the let's talk where we caught up on some superhero movies it took me like 20 minutes to get over the fact that i'm watching a movie with ezra miller in it after spending right, right, right. three years of hearing about <laughs> this guy doing things that are like really awful and like that genuinely affected my experience watching the film and then i started to watch the film for what it was and that genuinely affected my experience watching the film and so i cannot even imagine i cannot even imagine for something like this how people like will endure it if they have knowledge of the past material and like i'm nothing against the people who worked on it except for the people who signed off but like there is and, and besides the guy directing it rupert sanders like he's got great hits such as ghost in the shell 2017 and another not controversial film by any means whatsoever uh and then snow white and the huntsman which i know some people stand as being like just fun cheese but like yeah it's it's not good. It's not a good thing right now. Yeah, I, I don't begrudge anyone involved in production. Like, you got to work. You got to, you know, you got to pay your bills. You got to whatever, you know. And yeah. plus, it's, yeah, it's entirely feasible that people signed on who haven't seen The Crow. They're not whatever familiar with it. Oh, a comic book adaptation, whatever, you know. So I, I don't hold any personal issues with pretty much anyone involved with the other than, like, the theoretical people that I made up to be mad at <laughs> during what I talked about. But, like... You know, it's Hollywood. The point of Hollywood is to make money. And so they're yes. just doing their thing. But personally, I just <laughs> wish it didn't happen. I wish it didn't exist. And, yeah, you know, on flash forward to when the movie comes out and everyone loves it and it's transformative and people, you know, like just are totally transformed from watching it or something. I don't know. But that doesn't change how I feel right now. Like as a conceptually, I don't like it. So specifically pray that that does not happen <laughs> for the, exact they start remaking opposite. the other crow movies and TV shows, you know, now that, that might be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Cause why not? But bring back Edward Furlong, you know, sure. Why not cross it over with Terminator Fortnite can do it. They can do it too. <laughs> oh no. I just realized they're totally going to put the crow in Fortnite, dude. What emotes will the crow <sighs> have? I really don't want this. I really <laughs> just going wow on a guitar, you know. I just I'm this is really upsetting. We need to get into recommendations quick before like my <laughs> nights ruin. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. What what um what recommendation do you have for our listeners? Well, I'm gonna first. I'm gonna dust off a classic. I do have theological recommendations for people out there who maybe they're on the on on the go like I am, and so you don't have access to a robust theological library. I do have a couple uh, quick recommendations for phone apps that can really enrich your theological life and be of good service to you. (laughs) Well, the character limit and the show notes still exist. So give me three. (laughs) Uh, Okay. So I'll make it quick first uh, for a laptop and tablet. It does cost money on your phone. It's like two ninety nine, three ninety nine, but it's called eSword. Think of it as a free version of logos where it is compiled all of the public domain or easily accessed biblical resources that may sound cheap, but that includes things like Matthew Henry, pulpit commentary set, includes things like the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia and uh, books by Andrew Murray, Charles Spurgeon's Morning and Evening, Calvin's Institutes. It's all there for free on the uh, personal computer or tablet app, and it's for $2.99 or $3.99 on your phone. And as somebody who, you know, I, again, because uh, I'm doing stuff overseas, I don't have access to a li- library, but I can look at John Gill's commentary. I can look at Barnes notes. I can look at um, Andrew Alexander McLaren's 
uh, broadly, like, you know, his sermons that were produced as a commentary set. Uh, that's a great resource that I use all the time. Also, we recommend the Reformed Companion app. On this app, you have all of the confessions, catechisms, creeds, as well as a rundown of the doctrines of grace and five solas. Yes, it has scripture references for all the stuff in there. That's a good quick reference uh, for what I'm just need uh, to do some daily reading or even just want to reference something for someone who has a question about something. Uh, but if you just want a straight up Bible app, uh, I've recommended in the past the NET Bible app, which is great, and Blue Letter Bible. But I'm also going to throw out the Literal Word app, uh, which it has your Bible and the ESV or other very uh, uh, faithful adaptations. But if you click a button in the top right, it highlights words and just immediately brings up their Strong's Concordance annotations and definitions of the Greek and Hebrew words. It's great if you're just looking for the original language you know, doing some quick Bible reading, which when combined with the other resources I mentioned uh, is a good little biblical library to keep in the palm of your hand. Uh, I'll also, uh, we hit in the, we hit in the character limit. There's another thing I want to shout out. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. It's called Relight. It is your reformed study app. They don't have, as of this recording, a mobile version that you can just download from the app store, though the website is optimized for mobile it is a reformed resource, which is available purely through online. However, so it has the Bible in the King James and ESV. Like the other one I mentioned, it includes uh, the things like uh, Matthew Henry, John as Calvin's commentaries on there as Matthew Poole's commentaries on there. But the real, for me, the real, uh, what I love is the formatting. It's very easy to use is as uh, easily clickable links, little light bulbs next to the scripture verses. It'll bring up a word study tools. It brings up Calvin's commentaries and Matthew Poole. And it is just such an easy to use, uh, easy to access reformed study app. And again, that's something you can just access from the internet. So I don't have to buy any books or anything. So these are all things I'm using while out in the mission field. All right. God bless all the people who are working on these apps and keeping them afloat. They're not full of ads. They're not full of unnecessary mm. features. And they allow me to study God's word and share God's word and to continue studying God's word. Um, uh, without access to a physical library or resources that uh, that I used to have back home. So those are my recommendations for today. And I'm going to recommend something completely different, and it's not Monty Python. And it's probably a bit more... Well, we we had been talking... I had been asking Dan about like how things are with communication, just because he you know, speaks English. <laughs> and he was saying, yeah, jokes don't really translate. <laughs> and, and so here I am recommending a comedy special where the jokes absolutely would never translate well. Um, I'm going to recommend uh, An Evening with Tim Heidecker. Uh, this was a comedy special that was put on YouTube a couple years ago um, from Tim Heidecker. And it's a basically an absurd, ironic comedy wherein Heidecker plays a character that's uh, plays this character for the entirety of the show that is, how do I describe it? It's like a tasteless first time comedian. Um, it's not as, it's not a provocative a la Rob Schneider, but it is evoking Rob Schneider <laughs> with a, with a point in which like it's kind of uh, playing along how like these things are so commonplace, but absurd. It, it's very, very funny. If you're familiar with Tim and Eric type humor, Tim Heidecker's kind of continued stick for the last forever. Um, if you're familiar with his career, you are very familiar with this type of comedy. And if you're not familiar with his career, but you do like internet kind of weird humor, absurd humor, you're going to have a really fun time with this one. Uh, after the after his uh, set, he breaks character and plays some of his original songs, um, which are very, very ridiculous um, and extremely funny. Um, this is this. I think about this a lot <laughs> in terms of like some silly things that uh, that are consistent throughout, like some repetitive jokes he makes that are pretty good. Um, and it's free. You can just watch. It's like an hour, barely an hour. It's super funny. Um, but yeah, it definitely you got to be a fan of like absurd, ironic or kind of yes. his type of humor to enjoy yeah. it. Uh, I don't know if you watch this. This was like just out of covid. This came out. But, um, but this <laughs> so is really funny. The way I've experienced it is clips from it were shared online with no context. 
and circulate it. <laughs> yeah, that's even better. <laughs> right? Perfect. And so you'd see people going like, I understand. This is terrible. This isn't funny. Why are people cheering for this comedian? He just said something horrible. And it was, yeah, it yeah was, everyone's in on the joke. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I got it's I got my own unique experience with it from just witnessing it like that. I have meant to go. There's like a couple other comedy specials that are just free on YouTube, and I, that was one. That's one I've meant to check out. So maybe I, on your recommendation, I'll finally. It's free on YouTube, which is great for my current situation. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, any last thing you want to mention? Uh, any direction you want to give people for your missions uh, before we bounce out of here? So yeah, uh, I mean, first and foremost, I'd really ask for uh, people uh, to be praying, praying for me, and praying for us. You know, we, like I mentioned earlier, we are, we're constantly inundated with opportunities uh, in this field. Uh, but more more than anything, like beyond just the direction and, and uh, that we would have a clear idea of where the Lord wants us to go and what the Lord wants us to do. Um, first off, but pray for the hearts and minds of everyone that we encounter and do ministry with and share the gospel with, um, that he'd be preparing them uh, to hear and he'd open their eyes uh, to see and their ears to hear uh, what we will share with them. Uh, be praying for everyone that we work with as the number one reason that people leave the mission field is difficulty with working with people. Mm. And part of it is mm-hmm. just because so many different people, so many different cultures and backgrounds and languages are all coming together and working together for this shared endeavor. And so pray that God uh, unites us and that there would be patience and wisdom and that people would be quick to forgive and to understand uh, rather than to be combative with one another. As there are many differences, there are theological differences, there are different ideas of how best to proceed with things. There's different uh, concepts of what we should prioritize. And so that regardless of what those things are, um, that we would uh, put, put Christ first in all of our interactions. And also just be praying for myself and my wife as we are in a foreign uh, foreign country and uh, we are far away from home, far away from everything that we have known up to this point and that we would not uh, grow weary of doing what is good, that we would um, continue to uh, rely on God in, in difficult times, but that we would uh, find joy where we are and that we would um, just uh, continue moving forward as that can be difficult at times. Uh, so just uh, prayers for those three things. And uh, um, yeah, if, if anyone would be interested, I'm looking at maybe getting a sub stack or something, but currently I don't cool. have anything like that set up. But um, if you're interested in just hearing what we're doing or what's going on, uh, feel free to reach out to Melvin as I will pass along some sort of contact information. But should even if that should not arise, uh, yeah, uh, if you could even ask your missions committee to pray for us, ask your prayer group at your church to pray for us, but you can never have too much of that. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.